time, but it's a lot of fun to sing together, and it's a lot of fun to be together. I'm glad that you're here, and it's good to see you all here this morning. You know, um, there's quite an interest in spirituality these days. Um, I want to take Transfiguration Sunday as we conclude this series on awe to talk about for a moment uh, spirituality in general, uh, but really what true spirituality should look like uh, from a Christian point of view for each of, each of us who are attempting to answer that question that was put before us, which is um, about following Jesus. Are we following Jesus? Interest in spirituality has been booming in recent years, while interest in religion plummets, especially among millennials. How many of you have heard the phrase, I'm spiritual but not religious, right? Yeah. How many of you have uh, seen the bumper stickers when you're driving out there in the traffic of Lincoln? Uh, my karma ran over your dogma. Anyone ever see that one? My karma ran over your dogma. <clears throat> I have to want to still tell those people if we're getting the opportunity. You see, my dogma is about grace and about how I as a human being can't work my way to God. And the whole concept of karma is that there is no grace and that you have to work your way to God over thousands and thousands of lifetimes and reincarnations. And I don't know about you, but if that karma ran over dogma, I'm going to be a little sad about that. Of course, when I say things like that, my wife gets really annoyed. She's just keep driving. Stop having a philosophical conversation about a bumper sticker. <laughs> oh, my poor wife. Pray for her. <laughs> More than half of young adults in America, in the U.S., believe in, that astrology is actually science. Did you know that? The psychic service industry, which includes astrology, aura reading, mediumship, tarot card reading, uh, psalmtry, and among other metaphysical services, is now worth $2 billion annually. Big money, according to the industry analysis uh, firm IBIS World. In 2005, Gallup found that three out of four Americans believe in something paranormal, and that four in ten said that houses could be haunted. You ever wonder, like, people out there, many of which may be materialists, maybe they're your friends, they're atheists or materialists, or they think that the natural world is all there is. Isn't it interesting that when you look at what's popular in the movie theater, what, what's the subjects that you see in the movies? All things that have to do with the supernatural, right? The Marvel movies. Things that go beyond science, beyond materialism. It's so interesting. For me, it's a contradiction, or an interesting contrast at least, that while on one hand we want to say that, no, 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 we're materialists. This is all there is. On the other hand, there's this deep need to go beyond ourselves. And it's right there in front of us if you look at it. Superheroes, ghosts, goblins, witches, and etc. The paranormal, right? Half of those who say they have no religion frequent New Age bookstores. And they are especially prone to believe in ghosts, Bigfoot, and Atlantis. We live in an era where it's popular to hear people say, again, I am spiritual, but I'm not religious. I'm not religious. You know, Great Britain's pagan federation, Great Britain's like, for those who are interested in this kind of stuff, it's like the mecca of paganism and neo-paganism, heathenry. Uh, and so... There's a pagan federation in Great Britain, and it represents druids and witches and Wiccans. It's claiming that TV shows like Sabrina the Teenage Witch have fueled a rapidly growing interest in witchcraft among children. I was listening to a podcast once where there was a statistic about how many uh, children were calling into some of these pagan organizations after having watched things like, you know, Sabrina the Teenage Witch or the Harry Potter and by the way, I love Harry Potter. I think you can look at Harry Potter, watch Harry Potter, read Harry Potter. We did with our kids, so I'm not saying that. But I'm just saying there was this tremendous interest after these shows where kids were calling in and wondering about how to practice the occult and paganism. The organization averages 100 inquiries a month from kids who want to become witches. I've spent many years in studying, actually, the occult some level as a practitioner in the past. The occult, esotericism, 
particularly Western esotericism or what's known as the Hermetic tradition, a Wicca, neo-paganism. And I can tell you firsthand of its growing popularity. And again, this is a point of annoyance for my family because I was just recently in the mall and I'm in the mall and I'm looking at the, all the symbols in the clothing stores. And I'm pointing out to my wife, you know what that symbol means? Or that symbol right there? Or at least there's a lot of the kids' clothing stores. And my wife, again, she just hits me and she rolls her eyes and she says, please stop. <laughs> pointing out the Taoist symbols and the Wiccan symbols and the occult symbols. And they're filled. They're, there's all over t-shirts. They're all over the jewelry. It's everywhere. We're not even looking at it. But if you know what you're looking at, and if you've studied these symbols, these are mostly occultic symbols, esoteric symbols, Wiccan symbols, alternative spirituality symbols, non-Christian symbols. And symbols mean something. They mean something. Occultism and anti-Christian spirituality really took off in the 18th and 19th century, particularly in the West. And the reason was because people were becoming disillusioned with the hardcore materialism of the Industrial Revolution. They were also growing weary of the scientific age that said it could solve all of humans' problems or speak to all of humans' issues simply through science, right, and the physical world. People were also getting tired of the age of reason that said, if we could just study, we, the mind could contain everything, it could understand everything. And then you add on top of that, the hypocrisy of the Christian church, where the church was acting hypocritical, many decided to turn from these things and seek an alternative uh, spirituality. And they found those in the East. This is the time when people were heading over to the East and discovering Hinduism and Buddhism. Other schools, cultic schools, mystery schools and societies were, were, were born particularly in the UK at this time, and those schools sought to combine pre-Christian traditions with Eastern religions like Hinduism and Buddhism. This is the era, if any of you know, uh, Theosophy, anyone ever heard of the Theosophical Society, Transcendentalists, uh, Emerson, uh, Thoreau, American uh, leaders and figures were involved in the Transcendental Movement, uh, magic schools like the Golden Dawn, some of you are familiar with uh, Yeats, the poet, was uh, actually a member of that um, occultic school. And there were many of these societies that began to emerge. They were tired of the church. <laughs> they were tired of science. They were tired of all of these modern things. They were seeking still spirituality. They wanted spirituality. Many went east and sought the gurus and the shamans and the Buddhist monks for wisdom. And this laid the groundwork for the 60s. Groovy man. Right? And I, you, know, you all remember the 60s, right? I wasn't born in the 70s, so. So I had to watch you know, these YouTube videos and say, oh, what's going on? Why are they wearing those funny clothes? Those tight jeans that go kind of like out to the bottom or whatever. What's going on? You know, and the gurus didn't just all of a sudden show up. There was a steady stream going on for a while, for about the 1700s, 1800s. Seeking wisdom beyond the church, beyond uh, science, beyond uh, the West. And this laid the groundwork for the 60s and the New Age craze. Remember, anybody remember that term, New Age? Probably don't hear it that much anymore, right? It's called spirituality now, but back in the 70s or the 80s, it was called the New Age. It was the New Age craze, which led to people like Shirley MacLaine getting very popular. There's a name you haven't heard in a while, right? Remember Shirley MacLaine? Uh, Oprah, still a big part of that, probably a more popular figure, Oprah, Deepak Chopra, uh, Eckhart Tolle, up to our day where things, you know, things today, people just, when you say chakra or yoga or astrology or meditation, people know what you're talking about. It's part of our, it's part of our language, it's part of our culture. People are seeking, people are hungry for the divine. That's what the author in the book of Ecclesiastes in the Bible says, God has put eternity in our hearts. God has put something inside of us that desires something beyond us. We're made for, we're built for the spirit, for spirituality. We're built for God. Unfortunately, many are looking in places where there's tremendous limitations. And I would go further and say even 
falsity. They're looking in the wrong place. They're looking to the stars. They're looking to Kabbalah. They're looking to astral projection. They're looking to crystals. They're looking to cards and psychic experiences. You know, one major common denominator in the occult and New Age spirituality is that there is no sin and there is no savior. There is no sin and there is no savior. We're going to have to do a, a, a little uh, sermon on, on sin one day because I feel like we've grown very uncomfortable with the word sin, right, in our culture. And I think for good reason and for bad. One of the bad reasons is because when we say the problem has to do with sin, what we're saying is uh, there's a problem that humans can't fix. There's a problem out there that the Democratic or the Republican Party can't fix. There's a problem out there that our education system can't fix. And when we come up against that reality, we don't like that. Because now we have to say, well, what can fix it? Well, if the problem is sin, the one that can fix it is God. Does that make sense? And we don't like the idea of thinking that the problem is sin because that says, therefore, the solution's out of our hands. And we don't like it when we have to think of something being out of our hands. We're Americans, after all, right? We're educated. We're good-looking. We got a lot of square footage. <laughs> we can do anything, right? Isn't that, are you with me? So we have to kind of pause for a moment and ask ourselves, what's, what's going on? Can we do it? And our faith tradition says, actually, no, we can't because we're sinners and we need a savior. And there's two things that spirituality, today's spirituality, new age, whatever you want to call it, is absolutely void of is sin and a savior, right? New Age spirituality goes even further. It says, rather, you don't need a savior because you are savior. Matter of fact, you are God. You are God. And you just need to awaken to that fact. Now, if you are God, or nature is God, everything is God, why go to church? What you need to do is go inside your heart and just become one with the universe, right? Why believe in anything other than yourself? You become the center of the universe. You are the universe, as movie star and comedian Jim Carrey says. You are the universe. The problem with this is that I believe it's not true. You know, two world wars, the bankruptcy of modern secular philosophy, and the utter complete failure of the postmodern promise of science and technology to usher in a new age of utopia have clearly, I believe, demonstrated that we are still, indeed, in need of salvation. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> okay, good. The first lie ever told in the Bible, what was that lie? Do you remember? The first lie that was told in the Bible is told uh, when the serpent speaks to Eve. You can be like God. Remember? You can be like God. Before the serpent says that, he hits the question, the word of God. The serpent, the old King James says, the serpent says, hath God said, right? Hath God said? He spoke with Elizabethan English, a Victorian Elizabethan. So the serpents sound like Shakespeare, I suppose. Hath God said? Did God say? Question God, question God's word, and then introduce the idea that God is holding back. God is not good. God is trying to keep you from what is good. And what you need to do is become the standard of good. Become God. You can become like God. So that's how the deception goes. That's how the lie goes in Genesis. Question God. Question the goodness of God. And then replace yourself with God. And we know what happens, don't we? Sin and death enter the world. What does sin mean, sisters and brothers? What does that actually mean? When we talk about sin... Some of us grew up in churches back in the day where it was something like, you know, uh, sin is, uh, what? Um, eating chew and going with girls that do. Right? <laughs> something, something ridiculous like that. Right? No, no, no. Sin means missing the mark. That's what it means, literally. Sin means missing the mark. It means not hitting the bullseye. The bullseye is God's will. It's what God wants and what God desires. So anytime we are missing, 
missing the mark. We're not doing the will of God. That's essentially what sin literally means. It means missing the mark, not doing God's will. And God's will is where we flourish. God's will is where there's happiness and joy and peace and love and harmony. That's what God's will looks like. And so sin is departing from that, missing the mark. And people that do that still are spiritual. It's not like we stop being spiritual the moment we start focusing on our will or living in sin or being, uh, you know, having, having sin as our focus. It just means that our spirituality misses the mark because we, not God, become the center. Does that make sense? We become the center. So what does God do? Well, the whole story of Scripture is so God has to rescue us, ultimately by sending Jesus Christ to die for our sin and reconcile us to God, to ourselves, to one another, to the planet, to the universe. Now, today is Transfiguration Sunday. And this is probably, some of you are thinking, where is he going with this? This is Transfiguration Sunday. Why is he talking about all this stuff? Well, we're ending our awe series on Transfiguration Sunday. We've been talking about how in order to deepen in our walk with God and Christ, we have to have an experience, cultivate experience of wonder and awe to reduce ourselves, right, to that which is greater than ourselves. And that's what wonder and awe does. It teaches us that we're not in control, that there's a greater than us. And so we've been exploring, what are those greater thans? Well, we've looked at the cosmos. We've talked about we can cultivate awe by looking at our bodies. By even looking at animals, we can consider and deepen in the subject of awe. I hope some of you were doing that this past week. But this week, we're looking at Jesus. And we're ending here. Simply put, the more we enter into and appreciate the wonder of Jesus as God's Son and our Savior, the more our spiritual lives will deepen in God's grace, love, and wisdom. Now, you'll remember that on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus reveals his divinity to his closest disciples, Peter, James, and John. This experience of the Transfiguration was not only meant to point forward to the sufferings that Jesus was about to experience, but it was also meant to strengthen the disciples' faith. It was not only meant to, listen, it was not only meant to point forward to the sufferings that Jesus was about to experience, because if you recall, Jesus talks to Moses and Elijah about the sufferings he's going to accomplish in Jerusalem, namely his death on the cross. But this was also to be something that would help the disciples' faith so that when the trial and the suffering came, they could recall who Jesus really is. And the same is true for you and I. In this world of confusion and complexity and suffering, we seek answers. And where do we look? We look to spirituality. And our world and, cu and culture offers us a host of things, all things spiritual. And at one level, this is good because we're built for this. But are we going to seek spirituality in the spiritual systems of the world, in ourselves? Or are we going to speak, uh, seek spirituality in Jesus Christ? Do you see that? It's, where are we going to seek spirituality? This is the question, I think, that comes to us when we go up with Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration. That's the question I want to just stay with have to stay with us for the next few moments, okay? That's the question. The Mount of Olives, or the Mount of, excuse me, the Mount of Transfiguration encourages us to focus our spirituality and our awe on Jesus by seeing Him, not us, as God, and Him, not us, as humanity's ultimate Savior. See, Jesus, for me, sisters and brothers, stands head head and shoulders above uh, all the figures in world history as the one who we all have to do, as the one who speaks to the depths of the human condition. Not many people can claim such a resume. Maybe the Buddha, we can put the Buddha up in there, or the Muhammad, or Gandhi, maybe a few others that you can think of, but not much more. Not too many people that we can really put up there as the, the cream of the crop, would you agree, of humanity? Maybe those figures. But even among these, none claim to be God. None claim to deal with the problem of rebellion and sin, which is fundamentally a spiritual problem. A spiritual
commercial problem against a holy and loving and righteous God. Notice that when Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up the mountain, he is transfigured. His divinity is revealed, right? Moses and Elijah show up. Moses represents the law. Elijah represents all the prophets. In other words, Moses and Elijah represents the way that God revealed God's self in the past. And Jesus now is being presented as God's final revelation, as God's highest revelation. Jesus is the culmination of God's revelation. He's not one among many. He's not one prophet among many. You know, that's kind of what Islam teaches. Did you know that? Jesus is an important prophet, but he's not the final prophet. Muhammad is. Well, here in this passage, we're learning that Jesus is the final prophet. Jesus is the ultimate prophet. And so they discuss, Jesus with Moses and Elijah, the text says, they discuss the redemption and salvation that Jesus is about to secure. And Jesus, or excuse me, as Peter gives his two cents. Remember what, Jesus, remember what Peter says on the mountain? Yeah, it's good for us to be here. Hey, Jesus, Elijah, Moses, let's take a selfie. Come on. He wants to snapshot. He wants to memorialize it. He wants to build booths. And he wants to, he wants to kind of hold on to the moment, right? He wants to, and we have to chuckle at Peter. We have to chuckle for, you know, what he's doing. But then a cloud overshadows them. Anytime you see a cloud in the Bible, you have to think of a theophany, a showing up of God. God's about to show up in a, in a very unique way. And so all of a sudden, a cloud overshadows them on the mountain. And the CEB translation of the Bible, the common English uh, translation, says, They entered the cloud and were overcome with awe. Then the Father's voice comes from the cloud. This is my Son, my Chosen One. Listen to Him. What do we learn from this? Well, Jesus is not a guru or mystic who tells them to find God within Him. Themselves, is he? If they're going to find and hear God, they must enter the cloud and they must be overcome and affected by awe. Awe of what? Of what the voice says and who the voice points to. Jesus. Jesus is God's only Son. Jesus is the unique Son. Fully God. Fully God. I don't mean to be picking on Islam, by the way, today, but I was just, um, recently I heard that the worst thing you can do in Islam is to commit shirk. Now, I used to think the worst thing you could do in Islam was to portray the Prophet Muhammad. Have you ever seen uh, the news, or if you maybe know a Muslim, they don't portray the Prophet. They don't paint a picture, right? It's like, the, I thought that was the worst thing you could do, but there's this thing called shirk. That is the worst thing you could ever do. It will get you in trouble, get kicked out of the family. You will be in big, big trouble if you do shirk. I'm going to do shirk for you right now. You ready? Here it comes. You ready? Jesus is the Son of God. I just committed shirk. Islam says you cannot ever, ever, ever believe or even say such words. And yet, these are the words we claim as Christians. God the Father says of Jesus, You are my Son. You are my Son. And so Jesus is the unique Son. He's the Son of God. He's divine. He is God of God, right? He is God's Word. And the disciples are not told to listen to their feelings. Remember Star Wars? Remember Obi-Wan Kenobi when he's trying to teach Luke to get in touch with the Force? Remember? Remember what he says? Listen to your feelings, Luke. The voice on the mountain doesn't say, listen to your feelings. The voice on the mountain says, Listen to the Christ. Listen to Jesus, not your feelings. So here's the first point. We develop our awe in God by seeing Christ as divine and as God's final word and listening to him. So let me ask you, who are you listening to? What are you listening to? Who are you listening to? What are you listening to? Whoever you listen to and worship and listen uh, will determine your state of wonder. Deepening in wonder means entering the cloud, not yourself, right? This is beyond yourself. And 
You can do that when you study scripture, when you pray scripture, when you get into the word, when you just pray and spend time with God. Or when we gather together, we should be experiencing this in community and practicing the presence of God on a daily basis. These are times that we can enter into this truth of allowing the, the deity of Christ to penetrate us, to make Christ the object of our attention and to listen to him really quickly because time is gone. Secondly, we have to deepen our awe of Christ when we claim and celebrate him as our Savior. You know, Peter, James, and John had been listening just a few moments ago. They would have heard Jesus talking to Moses and Elijah about his departure, which would be accomplished in Jerusalem, which we know came by the cross. They were talking about redemption. They were talking about redemption. Jesus is not only divine, he's human. He can suffer, he can die for our sins. So not only do we see Christ as the divine one on the holy mountain, we also see Christ as the Redeemer, who will suffer for the real human problem, sin, by dying on the cross and restoring us to right relationship with God in all creation. You see, this mystical experience was not about becoming our own personal saviors, was it? But by seeing the one through whom salvation would come. So trusting Jesus, trusting Christ as Savior, that really goes against the very grain of our self-help, self-empowered, self-expressive, self-made, self-created, self-actualized, self-discovered, self-assertive world, doesn't it? Our century of the self ain't too keen on saviors. And the spirituality of the world resists the Savior. But in the very spiritual, mystical experience of the Mount of Transfiguration, we learn that Christ, Christ is the Savior of sinners. Are you in awe of that? Are you in awe of that? Has that captured you? Have you gone back to that truth, that simple truth? Right? That God has forgiven us of our sins in Christ. That it is Christ who saves us. Not just once for all, but day by day by day as we trust him. See, we have to enter into this. This is what's going to prepare us for Lent and coming Easter. So who or what are you looking to for salvation? Is what will awe you and transform you? Is it Christ or something else? Let me just note in passing as we wrap this up. This is a painting by uh, Raphael. You see the Mount of Transfiguration, the disciples... At the bottom there. And way down the mountain, you can see off to the right. You see the boy whose kind of arms are just like this? And his eyes, you may not be able to see them, but they're almost rolled up in the back of his head. That is a child that was possessed by a demon or demons. And there's his father holding him. You'll know that after they uh, see Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, they learn the lesson to, to listen to him. And they walk down the mountain. They encounter the father whose son is demon-possessed. And the disciples down the mountain, the other disciples, can't do anything about it. They can't alleviate the oppression. It's a very sad picture of disciples of Jesus who don't have any power to heal those who are oppressed by darkness. It's a very sad and powerful picture. But I just want to note in passing that this next scene that we had put before us in today's reading, when they come down the mountain and face the demon-possessed boy, it's very interesting to note that on the mountain, the three disciples... I'm here. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. <laughs> Is that the voice from the mountain? I'm here. <laughs> the three disciples heard the voice of the father towards his son and were to deepen in their faith because of it. But when they descended the mountain, they heard the desperate cries of a father whose son was demon-possessed. That was a condition that rested. That's what I thought. Okay. Really odd. Thank God we're almost done. If she sneaks back in, we'll have to tell her to stop. My simple point is this. They come down the mountain and Jesus laments. He calls them a faithless and perverse generation because they're not able. They're not able to deliver the child. And the reason why they're not able to deliver the child is because they haven't come to grips with the wonder and the awe of Jesus. 
faithless and perverse generation is what the, the Israelites were called in the days of Moses when they witnessed what God had done in leading them out of Egypt and all the miracles that God had done. And Moses tells them, you're a faithless and perverse generation. Jesus uses that same language because he wants the disciples to know, you have seen the glory of God. You have seen the wonder of God. You have seen the miracle of God. And you have seen it in me. But yet, because you have not really taken it in, you lack power. And so here's where we're left. And here's where I'll leave you. This whole subject of awe is not just to deepen us in the the miracle of God and the awe of Christ, but it's also to deepen us so that we would bring that to others, that we would bring that power, that we bring that healing to others insofar as you and I are given over to Christ as Lord and Savior. So developing in the awe of God means being drawn to Christ. Right? We discover the truth. Christ, our creator, Christ, our savior, Christ, our friend, and that brings power. It's power to help others. That's a good place to end this series, noting that if you and I are to be a people who bring healing into the lives of others, we must, by faith, enter the cloud and be in awe of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. So God, help us to do that as we think about many of these thoughts. Uh, we pray that you would help us as we end this series to deepen in our awe of Christ as Lord and Savior. In your name we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen.